This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by Logrhythm. There's a lot riding on the shoulders of cybersecurity operations teams, a company's reputation, a hospital's health records, an entire community's drinking water, the weight of protecting the world. It's a load Logrhythm helps lighten. Logrhythm's engineers and analysts have been on the front lines of many of the world's most significant attempted cyber attacks. As allies in the fight, Logrhythm helps busy and lean security operations teams close gaps in manpower, increase knowledge of new attacks and techniques, and save the day, day after day. Learn more at logrhythm.com. The UN condemns Russia's war in Ukraine. Ukraine's cyber volunteers may be targeting Russian infrastructure. Belarusian cyber operators are fishing with stolen Ukrainian credentials. Task Force Klepto Capture. Infusion pumps are found vulnerable to cyber attack. T-Bot is found in the Play Store. TCP middle box reflection. Daniel Prince from Lancaster University on trustworthy autonomous systems. Our guest is John Shigarian from ERI on the security angle of e-recycling. And no more Harleys for Mr. Putin. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. Russian forces have intensified their conventional and, in practice, indiscriminate bombardments of Ukrainian cities. The Black Sea port of Kherson has fallen, the first Ukrainian city of any size to be taken by Russian forces, but the assault on Kyiv remains more stalled than ever, the BBC reports. The UK's Ministry of Defense, in its daily public appreciation of the situation, says the Russian column advancing on Kyiv has made little discernible progress in over three days. The MOD puts this down to Ukrainian resistance, but also to congestion and mechanical breakdown. The UN General Assembly voted yesterday to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In its official statement, the UN wrote, quote, Deploring in the strongest terms its aggression against Ukraine in violation of the Charter of the United Nations, The Assembly also demanded the Russian Federation immediately and unconditionally reverse its 21 February decision related to the status of certain areas of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine, end quote. Thus, not only the invasion itself was condemned, but so was the Russian recognition of the independence of the regions it styles the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. The resolution of condemnation had been introduced by Ukraine. The vote was 141 in favor of the resolution to five opposed with 35 abstentions. The UN called the vote a clear reaffirmation of the 193-member world body's commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity. The list of countries who voted nay is instructive. Belarus, North Korea, Eritrea, Syria, and of course, Russia. Ukraine's Ministry of Defense has recruited private operators to help wage a cyber war against Russia. That recruitment isn't principally designed to provoke a cyber rave or cyber riot on that part of outraged sympathizers freelancing as volunteer militia, although that's also happened, certainly in the case of website defacements and service interruptions conducted by Anonymous and others. There are reports that the ministry has asked a local cybersecurity expert and businessman, Igor Oshev, to organize a cyber offensive that would go beyond DDoS and defacement and seek to cripple Russian infrastructure, with particular attention to railroads and the power grid. Ukrainian officials declined a request for comment by Reuters. The hacktivists continue to claim that they're counting coup against Russia, and some of their efforts may, and we stress may, go beyond vandalism and nuisance hacks. Homeland Security Today reports that Anonymous is crowing high over an effort directed against Russian space surveillance and reconnaissance systems, quoting the Anonymous-affiliated group NB65 as follows, quote, 
The Russian space agency sure does love their satellite imaging, they posted Tuesday morning. Better yet, they sure do love their vehicle monitoring system. The WSO2 was deleted, credentials were rotated, and the server is shut down. Network Battalion isn't going to give you the IP. That would be too easy, now wouldn't it? Have a nice Monday fixing your spying tech. Glory to Ukraine. We won't stop until you stop dropping bombs, killing civilians, and trying to invade. Go the F back to Russia. End quote. Russia's cyber operations against Ukraine may be continuing to take advantage of services offered in the criminal-to-criminal market. Zscaler describes the way in which the malware-as-a-service platform Danabot is being used to run a distributed denial-of-service attack against the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense. Zscaler's research report stops short of attribution. Quote, It is unclear whether this is an act of individual hacktivism, state-sponsored, or possibly a false flag operation. End quote. Proofpoint has published a report on a phishing campaign it's calling Asylum Ambuscade, and which it links to UNC-1151, which Proofpoint associates with the Belarusian threat actor it tracks as TA-445. That group is most familiar in its ghostwriter guise, in which throughout 2021 it mounted influence campaigns against European targets, especially in Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Proofpoint summarizes its key takeaways as follows, quote, Proofpoint has identified a likely nation-state-sponsored phishing campaign using a possible compromised Ukrainian armed service member's email account to target European government personnel involved in managing the logistics of refugees fleeing Ukraine. The email included a malicious macro attachment which attempted to download a malware dubbed Sunseed. The infection chain used in this campaign bears significant similarities to a historic campaign Proofpoint observed in July 2021, making it likely the same threat actor is behind both clusters of activity. Proofpoint is releasing this report in an effort to balance accuracy with responsibility to disclose actionable intelligence during a time of high-tempo conflict. End quote. Asylum Ambuscade represents an intelligence collection effort. It shows signs of being particularly interested in the movement of refugees around and out of Ukraine and is, the record reports, paying particular attention to targeting European officials involved in refugee relief. The U.S. Department of Justice has formed an interagency task force, Klepto Capture, designed to investigate and prosecute white-collar crime, with special attention to finding and denying the assets of Russian oligarchs, the Wall Street Journal reports. It has two objectives— Sanctions enforcement, which will include educating companies who trade with Russia on the sanctions' scope and implications, and tracking down illicit assets, especially those useful in money laundering, with special attention to cryptocurrency holdings and transactions. Recent U.S. enforcement actions against domestic money laundering operations, notably the indictment of Razal Khan and her consort, have shown that cryptocurrency wallets and transactions are not immune to tracking and confiscation. EU and U.S. policy toward Russia's oligarchs is now decidedly punitive, according to the Washington Post. The article's deck summarizes, quote, Western allies plan to confiscate yachts, jets, luxury apartments from Russian elites in hopes of undercutting Moscow over invasion, end quote. Punishing the oligarchs was one of the talking points in U.S. President Biden's State of the Union speech this week. Quote, Tonight I say the Russian oligarchs and the corrupt leaders who built billions off this violent regime, no more, he said. We're coming for your ill-begotten gains. End quote. Task Force Klepto Capture represents an early step in that approach. Not all the scary news is from Eastern Europe, even in these dark days of war. Palo Alto Network's Unit 42 has published a report on vulnerabilities affecting medical infusion pumps, analyzing more than 200,000 pumps from seven different vendors. The research identified, quote, over 40 different vulnerabilities and over 70 different security alerts among the devices, with one or more affecting 75% of the infusion pump devices we analyzed, end quote. More than half of the vulnerable pumps were affected by CVE 2019-12255, a buffer overflow vulnerability with a severity score of 9.8.
Researchers at Cleafy warn that the T-Bot Android banking trojan has been distributed via the Google Play Store. The researchers stated, quote, On February 21, 2022, the Cleafy Threat Intelligence and Incident Response Team was able to discover an application published on the official Google Play Store, which was acting as a dropper application delivering T-Bot with a fake update procedure. The dropper lies behind a common QR code and barcode scanner and, at the time of writing, it has been downloaded over 10,000 times. All the reviews display the app as legitimate and well-functioning. End quote. Once downloaded, the malware will request accessibility services permissions in order to view and control the screen and perform actions on the phone. Akamai researchers have recently observed DDoS attacks using a new technique called TCP middle box reflection to amplify the amount of traffic they can send. The researchers explain, quote, This type of attack dangerously lowers the bar for DDoS attacks, as the attacker needs as little as 175th the amount of bandwidth from a volumetric standpoint. And finally, back to Russia for some economic and cultural news. Western companies continue to exit the Russian market as the country's financial system reels on the verge of collapse. The AP reports that Russia has become a commercial pariah as the rest of the world increasingly refuses to do business there. Tech companies are largely out and social media platforms have shuttered operations rather than accede to Moscow's insistence on censorship and positive control of the content they distribute. One interesting business departure is that of Harley-Davidson. President Putin has been famously devoted to his hog, which he rides helmetless, like he's some kind of a centerfold in outlaw biker or iron horse. Let those who ride decide, we suppose, although the three-wheeler we've seen pictures of him tooling around on looks sort of like what the Hells Angels would call a garbage wagon. Anywho, no more Harleys for you, sir. Back to that old Ural gear-up. But bikes and beards say it's a pretty unreliable ride, so bring your toolkit and some spare spark plugs. And now, a word from our sponsor, Dragos. The industrial cyber threat landscape is constantly changing with new adversaries, vulnerabilities, and attacks that put operations and safety at risk. Asset owners and operators need proactive, actionable information with defensive recommendations to combat the world's most significant industrial cybersecurity adversaries. Be among the first to access the Dragos 2021 ICS OT Cybersecurity Year in Review Report. The report provides everything you need to know about cybersecurity headlines, the ICS and OT threat landscape, and security trends seen at industrial organizations in 2021. Prepare your cyber defenses today. Learn more and download the free report by visiting dragos.com slash year dash in dash review. That's dragos.com slash year dash in dash review. And we thank Dragos for sponsoring our show. Most of us who've been in the industry for a while have a story or two about some old forgotten piece of equipment that through benign neglect ends up being improperly disposed of. Years ago, I fished an old laptop out of the dumpster behind my office and the personal information it contained on the non-profit CEO to whom it had once belonged was chilling. And yet, end-of-life disposal of e-waste often remains an afterthought and that has security implications. John Shigarian is chairman and CEO and co-founder of ERI Electronic Recyclers International. So we all became very socialized to the wonderful shredded trucks that would cross this country in North America, showing up at our facilities, our companies, and shredding the data on paper that came out of the companies or organizations we work for. What we didn't think about is as the trend of paperless office was overtaking our work environments, who was thinking about the data that was embedded in and around our hardware? And that has still not been 
addressed on a widespread basis, yet in the United States or around the world. And in many cases, these issues of benign neglect have led to very dire consequences for the organizations that were victimized. Can you give us an example? I mean, what sort of uh, stories have you run into in the folks that you deal with? Well, just recently, it was very publicly made aware that Morgan Stanley years ago had a very bad data breach that was due to the inappropriate disposal of some of their server equipment. They got fined in Europe. They got fined by numerous organizations for that mishandling of their servers and other hardware. Other organizations which haven't made the cover of the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times that come to us for help. I'll give you a few examples. Federal agencies who found their employees unwittingly when their laptops or other electronic devices came to their natural end of life, put these items up for sale on eBay or Craigslist, putting at risk not only the agencies they work for, but in many instances, the homeland security of our great country. Those examples are growing and been well documented. Well, help me understand the the, the spectrum of uh, disposition and, and disposal that are available. I mean, I, I think uh, a lot of us imagine, you know, taking that old laptop out to the parking lot with a hammer and, and uh, having at it ourselves. But there's more to it than that. Yeah, there's more to it. A, unfortunately, electronics shouldn't be mishandled by anyone because most of them contain arsenic, beryllium, lead, cadmium, mercury, a whole host of trace hazardous materials that people don't want to get either into their own body or into the ecosystem, which could then leach into ground water supplies, our vegetation, our animals, and again, back into people because it gets into our water supply and other things. So electronics, when they come to their end of life, should be responsibly handled. Now, whether that means wiped, retested, and resold, appropriately wiped, or fully destroyed is based on the organization or the level of risk that that person is engaged with. So, for instance, we have many organizations that come to us and say, hey, John, we want you to wipe all the data, and then we want you to put it in your shredders. We have the world's largest shredders at our facilities and shred it, and then we know that all of your commodities are sold, and that shredded material goes away into new products anyway. We're very happy with that. Others come to us and say, listen, we're going to get you 10,000 used cell phones, laptops, tablets every month. It's going to be a consistent number. You're going to wipe them. You're going to retest them. You're going to check them for data again. Then you're going to repackage them and resell them. So there's lots of protocols that can be done, but the whole essence of the matter, David, is that people need to choose a responsible company, just like Shred It and Iron Mountain and other responsible brands shred data on paper. The same thing goes for when people choose vendors to shred data that's embedded in hardware. And whether the hardware means their wearables or the other gadgets in their homes that are now collecting data, such as Ring and Nest and other things that should be destroyed at some point when they come to their end of life, or just their old hard drives, desktops, laptops, tablets, or server farms, a responsible party, a responsible vendor, one that's NAID certified. NAID stands for National Association of Information Destruction. That's the platinum standard that any vendor that handles your old electronics should be certified to. And if they're not certified to that, that goes for both data on paper and data in hardware. And if they're not certified for that, they shouldn't be handling your data materials that are on paper or in hardware. 
That's John Shigarian from ERI Electronic Recyclers International. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud. SpyCloud constantly recovers and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, a realm packed with credentials, personal information, passwords, and customer information exposed in third-party data breaches, combo lists, and malware infections. With SpyCloud, you now have access to this data that historically has not been available and can take preventative efforts to defend your business against costly cyber attacks and hard-to-detect fraud that can negatively impact your bottom line and brand reputation. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire to learn how to make recaptured data your best defense. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Daniel Prince. He's a senior lecturer in security and protection science at Lancaster University. Uh, Daniel, always great to welcome you back to the show. Uh, I know a topic that you have been working on there at Lancaster is this notion of trustworthy autonomous systems uh, and complexity in the network stack. Can you share with us uh, what sort of things uh, are you all working on there? So I'm part of a project here funded by the EPSRC that's looking specifically at trustworthy autonomous systems. It's one of a a number of projects that are are research nodes within the UK. And the part of work, the work that I'm looking at is really the role of the network stack within these autonomous systems and and how the network stack, so IP communications uh, and and so on, um, form part of this autonomous system and work toward the work towards the trustworthy nature of of that autonomous system specifically obviously the network stack is the way that the autonomous systems communicate with each other and so if we can disrupt that the the way they communicate can we also understand how that affects their decision making capability and their trustworthiness as a, as an autonomous system and one of the things that we're looking at and trying to understand is that if you know, at the operational plane, at the higher levels, you've got things like AI and machine learning making decisions for the for the autonomy of the, the overall system. Say, for example, a you know a swarm of drones or or a fleet of self driving cars. What are what are the aspects of the network stack that actually go into influencing the decision making uh, elements of uh, the machine learning or, or the autonomous system? that we might not be aware of. So, for example, is there are there specific network delays, aspects of jitter in the way that packets are delivered, that we're not aware of, that, that have become implicit features in the data sets that the autonomous systems are using to make decisions. And if we have a better understanding of that, then we can understand more the robustness of the net, what the network stack needs to be, and the level of robustness required for autonomous systems to be able to make trustworthy decisions. Are those elements in the network stack, like like you mentioned, things like delays, uh, because those are elements of the systems themselves rather than, um, you know, part of the, the software that the developers are, are creating, does that create a, a bit of a blind spot for the folks who are building these autonomous systems? Well, I mean, that's one of the things that we're really trying to investigate. In some ways, it's it's going back to classic quality of service in networks and understanding the, the implications of the quality of service um, on the roles of the applications. Now, the autonomous system that's laid on top of that is, you know, a decision-making application. Um, and it's using features of the network in terms of its quality service, or that's how we're, we're perceiving it, to, to be able to make those decisions. And we're at the moment, what we're trying to understand is how many, how much of uh, that quality of service features, if you like, um, are implicitly part of the data set that the autonomous system is uh, using to, to make decisions. And so what, what we're trying to, to understand is instead of targeting or perhaps attacking the data that's being transmitted around the network for the autonomous system to be able to make the decisions, are there elements of the way that the network is working that we could disrupt, which would disrupt disrupt the trustworthiness of the decision-making within an autonomous system? 
And if we can if we can understand that, then we'll be able to make more robust systems to be able to make decisions within the kind of uh, networks that we're looking at. So the peer to peer kind of drone networks or or self driving cars. Sort of a, a fail safe system uh, built in. Yeah. So one of the yeah. So one one of the things if we know that the limits of the the autonomous system are within these, say, for example, quality of service parameters, then what we can say is that if if those parameters are, are, are breached, you know, the composition of, uh, of that network is breached beyond the safe operating parameters of the uh, of the autonomous system, then then we can put in these fail safes as you as you say, so that the so that again, you know, the operators will have trust in the system that it can be used in in a safe way um, without you know and respond to the any potential disruption that that might occur either accidentally because of the operating environment or maliciously if there is an attacker that goes after the, you know, the, the, the fleet of drones um, delivering uh, your parcels or shopping. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, interesting stuff for sure. Daniel Prince, thanks for joining us. Thanks to the sponsors who make the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, providing the foundational knowledge to meet the growing need for highly skilled information assurance and privacy professionals. Stay tuned to hear about the Institute's world-class master's degree program in cybersecurity. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The Cyberwire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing Cyberwire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Now a word about our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, providing the technical foundations and knowledge needed to meet our nation's growing demand for highly skilled professionals in the fields of information security, assurance, and privacy. We value their expertise and insights as one of the CyberWire's academic partners. And of course, they're one of the world's great research universities. The Institute is also an NSA and DHS-designated Center of Academic Excellence in Information Assurance in Cyber Defense Education and Research. It's not too late to apply for the Institute's world-class master's degree program in cybersecurity, since the application deadline has been extended and financial aid is available. Visit isi.jhu.edu to learn more. And we thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for sponsoring our show.